so after the discussions, the very interesting discussions and exchanges that we had uh, this morning, um, I would like to enter into the detail of the um, uh, of the European um, the EU Roma strategic framework for equality, inclusion, and participation. This is the policy framework that uh, will uh, pave the way towards the policies um, until 2030. And I will also provide you information on the Council recommendation that was adopted last week on the 15th of March. Um, but these uh, policy frameworks will only work if they are aligned with the funding opportunities. Uh, therefore, I will also uh, cover in my presentation the European Social Fund Plus, ESF Plus, which is um, the main uh, tool that uh, the EU and its member states have to invest in people. So it's a, a social uh, investment uh, tool. So uh, concerning the EU Roma strategic framework, so this is the policy side, as you know, and as was mentioned already this morning, uh, the previous framework that ended in 2020 uh, was focusing uh, in reducing the social and economic exclusion in the areas of education, employment, health and housing. Um, however, its midterm evaluation uh, did show that there was an added value, uh, an EU added value um, of this framework, but that um, uh, the progress had been limited in many areas. That is that uh, the framework did not deliver in all the results and the targets that had been uh, planned. Um, the, the evaluation showed that there was a clear need for a longer term commitment uh, at EU level, but also at national, regional and local levels. And uh, for example, um, I, I will now give some um, areas where um, um, a lot of work still uh, needs to be done. Uh, with regards to discrimination, for example, a Eurobarometer report uh, specifies that the share of uh, respondents who consider that anti-Roma discrimination is widespread uh, is at 61%. This makes Roma the group against whom discrimination is most uh, pervasive across the EU. Uh, two out of every five Roma have experienced discrimination during the last five years, and close to half of the general population across Europe would feel uncomfortable having Roma neighbors. Um, this is as regards discrimination, but when we look at the social and, eco and economic exclusion, the figures are alarming, uh, with only little progress of the over the last 10 years. Uh, to quote just one example, four out of every five Roma are at risk of poverty, and for Roma children, the figure is even higher. Um, so based on this uh, evaluation that was made on the previous framework, uh, the Commission revised uh, the new framework and presented it on uh, the 7th of October, taking into account these elements that did not work or which did not um, count with sufficient progress, uh, the Commission uh, presented a new, uh, a new framework. So this happened in October 2020. Then uh, the framework was officially launched uh, together with the German uh, presidency. And then it was followed by the Council recommendation of last week. Um, as we have already mentioned this morning, um, I think it is obvious to all of us that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a particularly uh, severe effects on uh, Roma communities. Uh, in some cases, overcrowded households or the lack of access to healthcare, clean water, a regular income or financial resources um, have uh, increased the uh, already existing vulnerability. Um, and it is uh, foreseen that the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic will put marginalized Roma communities at higher risk and therefore uh, widening the gap uh, on uh, inequalities. 
So based on this, taking into account the revision of the previous framework and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, the Commission proposes this uh, new framework for until uh, 2030. Um, as you may know, the previous framework, so the one that ended in 2020, had a focus on the socioeconomic integration of marginalized Roma um, with a focus on employment, education, house, uh, housing and healthcare. However, this is now translated into a new three pillar approach, which takes into account uh, the socioeconomic inclusion, but also other um, essential elements uh, that are equality and participation, which this is in line with uh, our discussions uh, this morning. So within this uh, pillar, um, I would like to highlight uh, some of the new elements that uh, would ensure a stronger impact. First of all, and this is a difference, uh, a, a novelty um, as regards the previous framework. Uh, now the, the strategic framework gives a stronger focus to the diversity among Roma. So it aims to ensure that national strategies meet the specific needs of different groups within Roma. Roma women, youth, children, EU mobile citizens, uh, stateless, LGTBI, older Roma, uh, Roma with disabilities, etc. Also the new strategic framework reaches out to all Roma, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic status. This approach uh, recognizes that all Roma can experience discrimination, also those who do not suffer from social exclusion. Um, the framework also acknowledges that inclusion is a two-way process. Uh, both sides need to make an effort. And this is why the strategy uh, targets not only Roma, but also all of the society. Uh, the new strategy also combines the mainstreaming of Roma inclusion across all uh, relevant policy areas with targeted measures, uh, which support an effective equal access uh, of Roma to, to the rights and, and services. And this point is uh, also reflected in the ESF plus, in the European Social uh, Plus um, philosophy as regards Roma inclusion. And in addition to these uh, elements, um, it also aims to accommodate the differences between the member states uh, because it, it increases the commitment and the accountability, but it also it takes into account the uh, different realities within each member state. And that's why we talk about a common but differentiated approach towards uh, member states. Now, uh, what are uh, the components of the package? There are these three. First, it's um, a communication. Um, which includes uh, guidance uh, for uh, member states to develop national strategies that will need to be uh, submitted in September this year, 2021. It also provides um, um, a portfolio of uh, indicators to allow for a monitoring, uh, pro uh, to monitor the progress. Um, it also included this draft council recommendation that has been uh, adopted last week. And finally, a staff working document where you will find all the methodological, uh, analytical and contextual basis of the, of the proposals. And here I'd like to uh, inform you that all these documents are all public. You can find them in the website of the uh, European Commission. And I will also provide you uh, within the slides with all the necessary links so that you can access them. When we look at the, at the objectives of the framework, uh, we have seven that are divided in two. The ones that are written in white are the um, horizontal objectives, which correspond each to the three pillars that we had mentioned uh, at the beginning. So in line with the focus on equality, the framework aims to fight and prevent anti-gypsism and discrimination. Uh, with regards to the social and economic inclusion, it aspires to reduce poverty and exclusion. Um, and so reducing the gap uh, between the Roma and the general population. And then when it comes to participation, the initiative uh, promotes a meaningful Roma participation through empowerment, cooperation and trust. 
So it aims at ensuring that uh, the participants of Roma, the, uh, that Roma can participate in all stages of the policy process in line with what was uh, discussed and highlighted as a, as a need uh, this morning. Um, so this is for the horizontal objectives, but then we have also the um, uh, sectoral objectives, with, which are the four um, that appear in yellow. Uh, these ones uh, each apply to, the, to one of the policy areas of education, employment, health and housing. For each of these uh, policy, uh, of these uh, seven objectives, the strategic framework proposes two or three quantitative headline targets. These targets are associated to indicators, which will allow to uh, effectively monitor and measure the progress achieved. Now, this is, uh, it was introduced to, to make um, a, a better monitoring of the, of the implementation of the strategies. And here I would like to clarify that the targets express the minimum progress that is hoped to be achieved by 2030, but the long-term aim remains to fully close the gap between the Roma and the general uh, population. Um, so just to mention some of the examples for the EU level target with regards to equality, uh, the new framework aims to cut the proportion of uh, Roma experiencing discrimination by at least half. Uh, in the area of inclusion, uh, it aims to reduce the poverty gap and the child poverty gap also by at least uh, half. As concerns uh, participation, the idea is to uh, engage at least 90 uh, NGOs in EU-wide uh, coordinated civil society uh, monitoring. Now, finally, when we look into the sectoral objectives, uh, we will find as well targets that include reducing the gap uh, in early childhood education, gender employment, uh, and the life expect expectancy gap sorry, by at least half, as well as ensuring that at least 95% of Roma have access to tap water. So this uh, was the, the framework, the main elements, and this is the calendar. Uh, so um, the, um, the commission has set out this reformed and strengthened uh, strategic framework. Uh, and now and during the months to come, member states are working in defining their national measures and they will need to submit their national strategies by next September, as I mentioned before, and they will need to report on implementation every two years. The Commission will then publish a regular implementation reports and will also carry out an in-depth uh, midterm and uh, ex post uh, evaluation. And in this regard, I would be very uh, interested in knowing if you uh, had been uh, involved in the process of um, elaborating the strategies, if you are being properly uh, consulted, etc. But that I will ask you afterwards. So this is for the policy framework. And here we have the council recommendation, also on Roma equality, inclusion and participation that shows the commitment of, uh, of the member states towards uh, addressing the challenges uh, faced by uh, Roma. So um, it takes into account the, um, the, and reviews the measures that were adopted in the framework of the past uh, council recommendation, and it provides a stronger guidance to member states um, uh, on how to uh, make a better use of the tools available in order to uh, register progress. Um, it sets out concrete measures um, in order to achieve the equality and inclusion and participation. It is uh, composed by these uh, five uh, chapters. Uh, the first one is uh, related to the horizontal objectives of uh, non-discrimination, uh, inclusion and participation. It also have, uh, has a chapter on the sectoral objectives uh, relating to the policy areas that I mentioned uh, before. And very important, and it has been uh, highlighted at different occasions 
in the opening of this uh, seminar, the partnership and institu institutional capacity. And here the recommendation um, calls member states to, to invest and to provide a better um, a capacity building for uh, civil society organizations. And so, um, there is a chapter dedicated to funding as well, uh, giving guidance on how the funding should be uh, used and on, on monitoring and reporting. As concerns the horizontal objectives of non-discrimination, inclusion and participation, here you will find the main elements, uh, which is about fighting against uh, discrimination in different areas, raising awareness of anti-gypsyism, but also promoting cultural awareness, positive narratives, uh, a stronger efforts to combat uh, poverty, material and social deprivation, and supporting uh, the participation of uh, Roma in the social, economic, political and uh, cultural uh, areas. As regards uh, the sectoral objectives, it's, it, it takes um, the, the objectives of the, of the EU Roma policy framework. So here, no surprises. Uh, you will be able to, to check the text of the recommendation and uh, in case you wish to uh, analyze it more in detail. Now on partnership and institutional capacities, um, the recommendation calls member states to support uh, national Roma contact points in terms of resources, staff mandate, political weight, but also involvement in the design of the policies and to involve properly uh, the equality bodies, uh, local and regional authorities in close cooperation and partnership with Roma and pro-Roma civil society. And here as well, there is a mention on the importance and relevance of transnational cooperation to foster peer learning and partnership. So precisely what we were discussing just before this presentation. As regards funding, um, we see that the recommendation calls uh, member states to make a better use of a mainstream and targeted EU and national funds. Uh, this means that Roma are to be um, addressed through all specific objectives of the EU funding, but in, so, in addition to that, uh, targeted um, uh, funding needs to be available in order to ensure that Roma benefit from the EU funding. Um, then there is also mention of the importance of the participation of regional and local authorities, economic and social partners and civil society in the process of designing and implementing the EU programs. The allocation as well of sufficient resources uh, to implement uh, the policies that are uh, laid in the strategic framework and also to uh, foster Roma inclusion through the national recovery and resilience plans that are uh, currently being prepared. Another very important point is uh, the one on capacity building and exchange of good practices that was also um, mentioned in the previous uh, chapter. Now on monitoring and reporting, it is important that um, uh, in order to see what has worked and the impact of the measures that are being developed, it is uh, necessary to, to develop an appropriate monitoring of national implementation using the portfolio of indicators. This means also defining uh, national qualitative and quantitative targets that are tailored to the national circumstances, so there is no one size fits all. Uh, but each member state needs to um, define these uh, targets. Uh, there is also an important um, a focus made on the transparency and policy learning and uh, the availability of the service by the fundamental rights agency at different stages in the uh, programming. Now, so once that we have uh, seen the policy framework, it is now uh, time to see uh, how to implement it, because it is very important that uh, we, we put the resources there where we want to, we want to, uh, uh, we want to go as concern uh, the, the political, um, uh, our political goals. So um, 
here I would like to first remind what are the, the what is the scope of the European Social Fund Plus, which is the fund that I will um, present to you and that I think constitutes one of the biggest opportunities to, to invest in, in Roma inclusion uh, together also and in synergies with the uh, ERDF, so the European Regional Development Fund. But uh, here I would like to recall uh, where we stand in the process. So the, the Commission uh, made a proposal for the European Social Fund Plus um, in 2018, um, which was discussed with the Parliament and the Council, but then the pandemic, the, the coronavirus pa pandemic arrived and the um, proposal needed to be uh, amended and revised to make sure that it responded to the new challenges that had been uh, brought by, by, by the pandemic. So uh, in January this year, uh, finally an agreement was reached um, on, the, on the regulatory basis for the European Social Fund Plus. And uh, this is what I will uh, present you now. So uh, concerning the scope of the ESF Plus, it aims to support uh, member states in tackling the crisis that was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is achieved by providing sufficient resources to, to member states so to, converse, to combat these uh, adverse uh, effects. It also aims to achieve uh, high levels of employment, especially for, for youth. Uh, which is a key target group uh, that was the most affected by the pandemic, but also it ensures that social inclusion, that uh, enough resources are uh, allocated to uh, social inclusion, which in the case now it's 25% uh, of the ESF plus we need to, to be uh, allocated to this uh, policy area. It also aims to contribute to poverty eradication, in particular for children, and this is a key aspect of the ESF now, and to grow also a skilled and resilient uh, workforce ready for the transition into a, a green and a digital economy. Uh, why uh, is it uh, an ESF plus and not an ESF as it, as it was in the previous programming periods? It's because uh, the ESF plus uh, combines, merges uh, different programs that were um, separate in the previous programming period. So we have the, the European Social Fund and the Youth Employment Initiative as well as the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived, the, the FEAD, and these three uh, are uh, managed through a shared management, with, which means that the Commission and the Member States work together in developing the programs, but it's the Member State uh, that um, uh, develops the program and then the programs are adopted by, by the Commission. Uh, and then we have the Employment and, um, and Social Innovation uh, program, which is called the EASY, and it's managed through uh, direct uh, management. So the idea is that by merging these funds, uh, it, it will ensure that the investments in people can be grouped together and that um, the synergies and the complementarities between these tools will be enhanced. Uh, now looking at the general objectives of the ESF Plus, which are defined in the Article 3 of the ESF Plus regulation. Um, so as a whole, the ESF Plus will aim to support member states to achieve uh, high levels of uh, employment, fair social protection, a skilled and resilient workforce uh, ready for the future world of work. So this would be in line uh, with the European pillar of social rights that, as you know, it's should be um, our compass uh, uh, for, the, for the years to come. In addition, it will also contribute to uh, policies which ensure equal opportunities, access to the labor market, fair working conditions, social protection and inclusion, as well as high level of human health protection. Um, so this is for the, for the general objectives. But then uh, these are translated into 13 specific objectives, which you can find there and, and are group, grouped in the areas of employment, education and training and social inclusion. Initially, there were only 11. And, uh, but uh, as an outcome of the negotiation, these have been uh, finally agreed 
to be uh, 13. Uh, you will see there uh, under social inclusion a specific objective that appears in uh, green. For the time being, it's called specific objective 8A, which aims at uh, supporting the socioeconomic integration of marginalized communities, including Roma. So this uh, specific objective was um, merged with the previous one, which was uh, referring to the third country nationals, including migrants and uh, marginalized communities, but it was decided during the negotiations that it would be very important to, to have a split uh, in two so that uh, the, it would be more clear uh, which were the, the groups targeted under each specific uh, objective. Um, <clears throat> these specific objectives will then allow to program uh, uh, measures in these different areas and it is up to the member state and its uh, region, in case there is a regional structure in the member state, to decide and select uh, the necessary uh, specific objectives. As concerns the budget, allocation as part of the multi-annual financial framework the total bu budget for the esf plus is set at um 87.3 billion uh, so for the esf plus is 88 billion but then for the shared management strand it's uh, 87.3 with uh, 666 million for the easy strand When we look at the horizontal principles that will need to be to apply to all ESF plus interventions, these are um, included in Article 6 and um, under the ESF plus member states will need to program mainstream and targeted actions uh, to support gender equality, equal opportunities and non-discrimination. In addition, the ESF plus needs to promote the transition from residential and institutional care to family and community-based care. And uh, in any case, uh, the, the ESF plus should by no means uh, support any action that contributes to segregation or to uh, social exclusion. Now, uh, one of the key aspe aspects of the ESF plus was to strengthen the, the link between the ESF plus and the European semester. So the, the policy uh, monitoring uh, and also in the framework of the country reports. So this was uh, um, a very difficult point in the negotiations, but in the end it was agreed that an appropriate amount of the ESF plus uh, need to support the country specific recommendations and challenges under the European semester. But then member states have the freedom to choose whether it's programmed under any specific objective or a priority, dedicated priority, etc. Uh, what is important also is to ensure coordination, complementarity and coherence between the SF Plus and other union funds, funds and programs and to avoid uh, duplication. And for that, uh, the authorities of other programs need to be involved in the preparation and the implementation of the, of the SF Plus. Now, one of the points that were more controversial during the negotiations and that took longer to, to agree on uh, between the Commission, the, the Council and the Parliament were these uh, thematic concentration requirements. This means that the regulation uh, sets out minimum requirements uh, that need to be where resources need to be allocated for specific uh, policy areas. And this was uh, contested because uh, the member states uh, considered that uh, it gave them uh, less flexibility to, to program. But at the same time, the Commission and the Parliament were pushing for uh, enough uh, sufficient resources to be uh, allocated to these key uh, policy areas. So finally, um, what, what was the result of the agreement is that at least 25% uh, of the ESF plus uh, for each member state. So each member state needs to allocate at least 25% of their ESF plus resources to measures that support social inclusion. This means that 
um, the member states need to uh, program under the specific objectives seven to 10. So remember the, the list of specific objectives that I showed you at the beginning. So 25% uh, of the national resources will need to be a program uh, with us. Um, there is also another thematic concentration requirement for support to addressing child poverty uh, um, that would come towards uh, this uh, social inclusion thematic uh, concentration. But in addition to the 25%, we have also uh, the um, requirement to uh, use 3% on top of the 25% uh, to be uh, allocated to the support to the most deprived. Uh, so this support would be over the 25%. And uh, it comes together with an agreed uh, co-financing rate of 90% for uh, support to the most deprived. So um, this, uh, the Commission did not foresee a special co-financing rate for this, but the agreement reach is uh, acceptable and is part of the overall uh, commitment compromise reach. So this should... Uh, um, incentivize uh, member states to allocate more funding uh, to the most deprived. Um, the college legislators also agreed on three types of thematic concentration requirements, which target those member states most in need. So the previous uh, requirements that I mentioned uh, are applicable to all member states. But here we have other requirements that only apply to several member states. And I will explain why. So the first one is the support to youth employment. Uh, the regulation calls to um, allocate at least 12.5% of their ESF plus resources uh, to those member states with a need rate, so not an employment nor in education rate above the EU average. Um, so this is a benchmark that was used to identify those, those member states with a serious and systemic problem in, in the area. And this uh, would apply to, to 10 member states. Um, then concerning the support to child poverty, uh, uh, at least 5% of ESF plus resources need to be um, allocated to this end. So to tackling child poverty, for those member states with an at risk of poverty or social exclusion rate above the EU average. And this would apply to 11 member states. In addition to that, uh, and this also applies to the youth uh, employment requirement, uh, the remaining member states need to allocate an appropriate amount. And this appropriate amount uh, is to be negotiated bilaterally between the member states and the commission based, of course, on data, Eurostat, or country specific recommendations, etc. And the third one uh, in the right, you will see it's the support to the capacity building of social partners and civil society organizations. Whereas, according to which 0.25% uh, will need to be um, allocated to the support to capacity building, and it is applicable to member states with a CSR, so a country-specific recommendation in this area. And the remaining uh, uh, member states need to allocate an appropriate am amount that is to uh, be negotiated uh, bilaterally. Uh, another key element of the European Social Fund it's a partnership, which is uh, um, defined in Article 8 of the ESF Plus regulation. And um, it's an element that has uh, traditionally been uh, essential and key in the ESF Plus. And similar to the previous uh, programming period, member states must ensure a meaningful uh, participation of social partners and civil society organizations uh, in the delivery of employment, education, social inclusion that are supported with ESF+. Um, so it was also decided, as I mentioned, that there is a minimum amount to be allocated to those member states with a country-specific recommendation. 
And uh, this uh, capacity building uh, can also be a program under any of the specific uh, objectives. And this can include, for instance, the training, networking measures, strengthening of social dialogue, uh, activities uh, jointly undertaken by uh, different um, partners. Uh, so this, uh, until now, I explained a bit the main elements of the SF Plus the regulation, but now I would like to um, go more in detail on how this can be translated into effective uh, measures that reach uh, Roma and uh, taking into account the final goal of uh, Roma inclusion. So first of all, uh, it is... Um, very important that uh, we align the policies with the funding. Uh, the investments must address the existing challenges, but also lead where we want to go. No? And in this case, it's a fair society that ensures the equality of Roma and uh, the rest of the uh, society. Um, and for this, and I mentioned the, what was mentioned before in the chat, that um, we need to reflect and discuss and exchange on what works and what is needed in order to have uh, useful uh, projects with a real impact. Uh, if we don't link the funding with the policy, then uh, it will be very difficult to, to, to reach that. Um, another uh, essential element is uh, this combined approach of mainstream and, and targeting. Uh, this is also mentioned in the strategic framework and uh, uh, but what do we mean with that? Well, we, we mean that Roma communities should be supported under all specific objectives, employment, education, uh, healthcare. The ultimate goal being the inclusion of Roma into mainstream education, labor market, housing, and society in general. But Roma are also to be targeted explicitly, but not exclusively, to provide additional support. Uh, in those cases where it, otherwise they would not benefit from, from the funds. Um, and here, um, but this can be translated in a program, for instance, uh, with um, um, a managing authority, a regional managing authority, for instance, saying, okay, I have these uh, measures foreseen in employment, uh, in education, and uh, the types of measures taking into account the needs of Roma children, um, of uh, Roma adults uh, getting training or um, improving their access to, to employment. But uh, in addition to that, that uh, region decides as well to program the specific objective of uh, support to Roma communities. And then it is ensured that part of the funds will target Roma. Um, in addition to this, um, the principle of the segregation and non-segregation needs to be respected. It aims at actively eliminating or significantly reducing the existence of uh, isolated settings and the principle of non-segregation aims to prevent that the EU funds will uh, establish new uh, isolated facilities or strengthening and perpetuating segregation, which is by no means uh, the, the, the objective. Um, another key element uh, towards Roma inclusion through, through EU funds is the uh, need for an integrated approach that combines investment in different uh, policy areas. Uh, because the needs uh, faced by uh, some communities are complex and are taking into account different uh, policy areas that need to um, work together uh, in order to and need, need to be reflected in the programs and the interventions. Uh, so within these different policy areas, the ESF Plus needs to work in synergies also with other funds. One classic example is with the ERDF, the European Regional and Development Fund that uh, can provide infrastructure and then can com be complemented with uh, ESF Plus. But these uh, synergies they need to be there since the very beginning, since the design of the, of the, of the programs. Um, and then based on the, uh, sorry, 
based on the on the on the point that was already made uh, at multiple occasions is that uh, there is a need to um, reinforce administrative capacity at the local level so uh, building capacity for local authorities and grassroots civil society organizations uh, because this point is also crucial for, for an effective planning of, of the investments. And in that, it also brings me to the importance of uh, involving uh, the relevant partners. In the case of uh, Roma, it will be very important that the ESF Plus Managing Authority works hand in hand with the National Roma contact points, but also uh, with, um, with civil society organizations and local authorities and bodies that are responsible for equality and non-discrimination. Now, why uh, we promote the specific objective uh, on Roma is to ensure this stronger alignment between the policy and the investments, but also because it can cover different policy areas that I mentioned uh, before. It may, in addition, um, program measures to overcome prejudice and discrimination, uh, to invest in administrative capacity and innovative actions. So this specific objective could cover all these different areas. Now, this uh, specific objective is linked to a thematic enabling condition. Uh, what is this? Um, member states which program, which select the specific objective on Roma, will have to ensure that they comply with all the requirements set in this slide of this thematic enabling condition of a Roma uh, inclusion strategic framework. Um, the enabling conditions are prerequisites -re to ensure that the necessary conditions uh, are there for the effective and, effective and efficient use of the funds. So there are two types, horizontal and thematic. And on the thematic, we have this one that makes a direct relation to, to the national strategy that needs to be in place uh, for Roma inclusion and that needs to include measures to accelerate Roma integration to take into account the different um, um, uh, different uh, the diversity within the Roma population with a focus on gender on young Roma and that sets a baseline and measurable uh, milestones uh, and targets, obviously. It also needs to uh, include arrangements for monitoring, evaluation, and review of the Roma integration measures. It needs to have arrangement, arrangements for mainstreaming Roma inclusion at regional and local level. So this is a novelty uh, as regards the previous uh, programming period. And also, um, it must ensure that there are arrangements to ensure that uh, the design, implementation, monitoring, and review is done uh, in close cooperation with the Roma civil society and other uh, stakeholders. So uh, for this thematic enabling condition to be fulfilled, all its criteria need to be fulfilled. So there is not a such thing as a partially fulfilled thematic enabling condition. Now, what happens if the thematic enabling condition is not fulfilled? It means that the commission will not pay uh, the um, uh, payment applications uh, linked to the, to the specific objective that is triggered by the enabling condition. So uh, this means that um, uh, member states need to work and are currently working on uh, preparing their uh, national strategies and are providing self-assessments on the uh, on the degree of um, fulfillment and they are doing so in a constant uh, dialogue with the, with the commission. So that's it for, from me. Sorry if I was uh, too long. <laughs> But uh, it was a lot of information to cover. Um, I hope um, it was not too much <laughs> and that you, you are still there. Uh, I didn't have the occasion to, to check the questions and answers, but I see that we have uh, some uh, here. So uh, I don't know. Vale, gracias. Sí, mira, por ejemplo, Josué Navarro. For instance, Josué Navarro asks you, 
If the improvement is not much regarding the discrimination of Roma people, it's because what they've been doing until now is not working. So what proposals or actions are to solve this issue? Does the new frame has include some measures to solve this issue that can't be solved? Why are we still talking about the same issues, endless issues for our people? And also, he said, excuse me, but as Roma, as Ipsy, I'm always listening to the same thing. And I, it's, yes, I, I really understand you, fully understand you. And I think that the new thing of this, the innovation of this political framework is that this has been made more visible because uh, we hadn't worked with discrimination specifically before. So this framework has non-discrimination and equality as a horizontal objective. So we think that with the specific measures of the national strategies, we will really will be really be moving forward towards the solution. But as we were speaking this morning, this is a continuous fight. We hope that it won't be an eternal fight. I, I really understand your frustration and I share it. And really let's hope that with ne these new possibilities, we can make a real improvement. Okay. Same person says, the strategy has been a complete failure, and it also says that we are the ones to be blamed for it. You've mentioned that we have to be part of the partnership to participate in all the stages of the inclusion process. But regarding the FSS plus 21-27 for Spain, we just had news at the end of last year that they were working on a draft since June 2018. And Roma entities didn't know anything about it. And regarding the third sector partnership, there's no Roma entity taking part on it. During the consultation time of that document, many Roma entities claim that the, we wanted to be part of that partnership as entities of the third sector, but the final document has not included us. So how can we wait for different results than those that we got on the strategy 2020? Well, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly specifically the situation of Spain, but I understand from that question that when they made a consultation, but they didn't take into account your comments. Yes, that's it. They didn't take into account. We were all claiming the same. We said that we it was difficult for us to get a representation in that partnership. So we can be there and we can monitor as well that their programs. Are you involved in the development of the ESF at regional level. You told me that you, uh, are you part of the monitoring committees of the national programs and so on? Because that's another way to be present in the programming of the ESF. Because national programs manage the funds which has been allocated to the different regions. And they are going to be managed from the central state. So we had to take into account social policies and competencies of the regions have to be taken into account. So it is important to be there. Yes, of course, here in Spain, well, we are beginning with that process right now. For instance, in the Valencian region, we are beginning with that process now. Of course, we are there. Every region, every administration, 
before they prepare their strategy, they call us and we participate. Of course we do. So that's why I was saying uh, we are a bit hope. We are not hopeful because we've been there and then the real decisions and the important actions, for instance, for education, those decisions are taken, but really there are awful things to be said about this. So we had our seminar in 2019 specifically to the assessment of the 2020 strategy. We know that each country ha has their own strategy and we wanted to know if the situation in Spain was different to the rest of the countries, but they all have been suffered the same situation. So we yes, we going to we have listened to Normud, but he was saying the same, honestly. That's the issue we are facing. So uh, the reason for this sem seminar is in which way we can work for the situation to change a little bit so we can work from bottom up. I think that one of the main issues with the previous strategic framework for Roma people was that it didn't have uh, enough resources. They didn't have the funding specifically for Roma people. Uh, it was mentioned, Roma people was mentioned, but it was not specific there. But with this new framework, they have reinforced this item. And also with the council recommendation, they are reinforcing this item. And also we have an informal negotiation with the state members and some other departments. We are beginning to exchange ideas, thoughts, indicators, and so on. And the commission is insisting in that for those member states that they are uh, challenging special challenges regarding Roma people. And within this context, there are specific recommendations for member states regarding Roma people. And it's affecting six member states, Spain is included, and the commission is insisting that to those countries, they need to have the specific goal for Roma people. So then we can be sure that we have the funding for social, Roma social inclusion, because the issue we have really is that the investment in a specific target, such as employment, education, they do not reach Roma population. That's why we are including now measures which are specifically for Roma population. And this is something that the Commission is really insisting on. Um, I hope we will see a very good result. We'll see what the pro programs are, but the program should give... Um, can I read them for you? Well, Jose Navarro says, we don't even have the chance to make mistakes. Some other people make make them for us. Laura Fuster said, you said that participation is key in the new European framework for Roma inclusion. But in reality, that participation is only in name during the process of developing regional strategies. But we are not taking into account for the important decisions. And they try to, to silence us with uh, a minimum, minimum amounts of money that they give us. And we will lose them if we say that we do not agree with them. Well, I think that it would be important 
to clarify something. On the one hand, I began to, to speak uh, in my presentation with inclusion, equality, and participation. Participation is a new element in the European framework. And member states should be developing their national strategies. On the other hand, we have a parallel work on the European Social Fund. And I think that this is what Laura is referring to. I think that you are talking about the, the preparation of the regional programs or what? Participation is only for the development of regional strategies, but are you referring to the funds or to the policies? Which strategies is she referring to? To regional, regional inclusion plans or, or European social fund? Because it's different. It's different. And well, this participation is just at nominal level, but we are not taking into account when they have to take important decisions. We cannot participate in the development of the policies, whether it is at European level, national level, or local level. I think it is more or less the same everywhere. That would be the comment. Okay. In Italy, we have a legislation that it's not punishing with uh, discrimination. Many processes where discrimination are not taken into account because they not, do not go to court. There's not a law, for instance, today in the afternoon, there's the recommendation 43 in 2000 from the European institutions creates a body in Italy to control discrimination. So in Italy, it is controlled by government and implemented by the government. So if I want to claim against the government, it's the government the one who has to do something about this. There's no an autonomy. There's not a legal protection. And it is within the national strategy. Yesterday afternoon, in Italy, we had the strategy from 2012 to 2020, but we received lots of money and there were no results. So what can we do at Europe? Because for instance, we can have a member state and one can apply, one can transpone the directive since 2000, it has only been partially implemented because there's not a third subject. It is the government who controls it and who rules it. Thank you for the context. I work for the European Social Fund so it is possible that I don't, I don't have the specific information about the non-discrimination policies, but I can say that in the new European Social Fund Plus, we have foreseen that the monitoring committees of the programs, because every program will have a follow-up committee, and that committee has to include independent bodies who are in charge for non-discrimination. And we see this as a huge step, at least regarding the European Social Fund. 
regarding le legislation in a general way i am afraid if you allow me to send this uh this question to the legal uh, direction there is a service working exactly for non-discrimination and they can give you more information about the legal current legal situation and what they are doing about it right now i think that would be the best thing to do sorry for the interruption i have a question here from angel galan the assessment mechanisms can be manipulated or tamper with even if we have outside companies administrations can use that in order to tamper with the real data who's going to control and monitor that regarding the strategic framework monitoring processes have to be independent and the social for the social social fund is the same so in the design of the evaluation and assessment plan assessment has to be independent we also have another participant asking policies regarding employment education and so on are based on reports but we know Roma people know that reports on education and employment do not reflect reality. How are they going to face those issues? Well, regarding the so European Social Fund, the analysis is not only done by reports, but we are also going to use statistical indicators and we are also going to have information by other stakeholders which are not public administrations and in that sense the work we are carrying out comes from different sources of information and we work then on the specific recommendations but i um i would like to ask you a question as well dear participant how do you think that we can find a solution for this do you think that we don't have sources enough uh, from the third sector because the commission does take into account the reports from the third sector. So which options are you suggesting that we add to this group of sources that we already have? Okay, tell us your proposals for challenges in education and employment, for instance. In the programs of the European Union, where we submit our projects, now we are facing a big issue because at the beginning where we have all the estimation which was the assessment of the project it was like this at the beginning and we already he asked the commissioner Laszlo back then, and he changed those uh, steps which were very difficult for Roma entities, because you know, uh, there are no big Roma entities. So always it was like corporations that were getting those funding, but not the small real Roma entities. They didn't have the chance to access that, that, those funds. Um, the criteria were amended in Brussels. So small uh, uh, entities could access, but 
I realized that the those external as, uh, consultants she still were evaluating and selecting the big organizations, but I can tell you it's almost impossible for a small entities to participate. How a real Roma project is not chosen and then they are giving millions of euros to things that are not reaching the Roma people and I think this is a huge issue and I have to tell you because I really know the European subject because I've been fighting for 10 years honestly just thinking how to sort out and how to overcome that barrier Well, I'm a bit lost because are you referring to social European Social Fund? Because the Commission doesn't assess the projects that has to be done at member state level because we have a shared management. So the European Commission Commission has a program for Spain for social inclusion in Spain. Uh, there we have the challenges and needs and how the program is going to be structured, which are the areas of investment, what kind of measures are going to be implemented, but we are not getting into details. So. It is a program of the structure of the foreseen investments, but it is the member state who will select the projects. That's why from the European Commission, we do not select the projects because this has to do with uh, regional authorities, for instance, uh, regional authorities, as is the case for Spain. There are some other uh, projects in, in Europe that are managed by the Commission directly. So, what the European Commission can do is to insist that in those countries where we have identified serious challenges, what the European Commission can do is to allocate enough funding for those countries but the commission cannot select who is going to to implement that project that depends on the member state yes but for instance not only for the esf fund there are some programs that depend on the general directorate of justice for fundamental rights or something like that. That had to do, for instance, with racism. And I think that it is the European Commission managing them. And for us, it's fundamental. And now I can tell you that it is absolutely impossible for a Roma, a small Roma entity to access to them. But I think there was a call for projects specifically to develop the administrative capacity of Roma entities. One of the requirements would be to give funding to the administrative capacity of Roma entities, but it's not finished yet. But uh, what I'm telling you is not about the lack of administrative capacity. I'm telling you about how projects are chosen. There's a structure there. So programs, I'm, I'm now just talking in generally speaking, not specifically speaking about the European Social Fund, but the programs of the European Union made make it impossible for medium-sized Roma entities to access to projects. I'm 
asking just in case there is something that will allow us access to those resources because this, those resources are there in the strategy 2020. When you asked what happened with the strategy 2020 in the regions, we had a very good relationship with previous governments with the people responsible for the European funds. We knew that they were receiving lots of funds and they didn't know what to do with it because they were afraid that if they were not using it properly and then they had an audit. But we have been told that they prefer to give them back and they gave them back because they didn't know what to do with them. And when we needed those resources, and this is something which is happening. Yes, this is a classical issue, the management of European funds. It is difficult to manage those funds, those European funds, because the Commission need full guarantees that the investment is being done properly. So, and the Commission also is audited. So, they have to be very careful. And so, the spirit of each new regulation is to try to simplify the processes of the monitoring processes. In 2020, we already went forward with simplified costs. It has not been easy. Because they had to change their mindset. Uh, they didn't have to work only with invoices and papers and documents. So, it was quite difficult because auditors as well had different interpretations. So now for 21-27, they are trying to work on this. And it seems that many member states are adopting this transparency and this is allowing people who are managing the funds focus on the content of the programs than on the paperwork and the bureaucracy. Because it was taking so much time. So they were managing papers more than the funds. The system is not perfect, but the system is what it is. We are trying to improve it. Uh, we'll see how it works now. There's one last question from Jose Navarro. Says, Teresa, you are very kind, giving answers to all the questions, and thank you very much for that. I just wanted for you to reflect on this, uh, on this thinking of the Roma people of the world. On the other hand, regarding what can we say about uh, how the data will really reflect the reality of Roma people? Maybe in those consultations and those monitoring, could maybe some Roma entity school participates in those consultations and those assessments as well. Thank you, Josue. Don't worry, I'm really writing down the questions and I'm going to to inform uh, about the disagreement of the Roma people and also the questions which don't have to do exactly with the European Social Fund, but for instance, discrimination, because there are many services at the European Union working for the inclusion of Roma people and all the feedback we have is very useful for us. And it's a way for us to improve 
the different systems that we have. The final goal of the participants of this seminar is always the same, is to reach the equality for the Roma population. And that's why we need your questions. We need just need your thoughts. And I'm going to send it to the uh, General Directorate of Justice. They have a team working on non-discrimination. So thank you very much. If we don't have more questions, now we'll close the morning session. Thank you, Teresa, very much for your kindness and for answering all the questions that we had here. And if we could applaud you from here. Yeah, it is a pity we cannot meet in Valencia. Yeah, I would love to be there, honestly. In Vallecas, you, you are also invited to Vallecas because we are slightly fed up with Brussels. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's been an honor to be here. It's been a real pleasure to participate and to see all that feedback because honestly, they help to improve our work. And they help to make our work more useful. Thank you.